well, thank you for staying and we've got a nice book launch afterwards. Okay, so I took the opportunity here, we've had some really interesting talks, to talk about a very exciting project that actually links um, many of the people who've already spoken um, today. And you as the taxpayers paid for it, so thank you very much. And this is on, um, this is on um, public housing, maximising wellbeing and reducing carbon. We were very aware of the fact that um, Kaingora, which I have to um, con confess or I have to uh, acknowledge that I am on the board of, so um, you, you, you can um, subtract a level of admiration that I have for the organisation <laughs> as being a participant in it. But it seemed to me that things were moving very fast and that, in fact, we need to know when we put in place new policies whether, or in fact, they do work. So I gathered together the um, team of people that I've worked with, um, which I'll explain, and we thought about how can we research this so we know how to reduce carbon. So as you might have seen from the books outside, we've been working with many of the people in the room here um, for about 20 years um, now on this project, and this is one that actually um, Guy was involved with, Guy Salmon was involved in too. We were concerned about a number of things. Um, first of all, home ownership is at the lowest level in 60 years. The public housing waiting list actually is closer to 22,000 people now. Um, most people prefer standalone housing, but apart apartments, as you've seen from the illustrations from the previous speakers, are increasingly popular with young people and older people um, who are very interested in compact neighbourhoods where they can cycle and walk around. Um, and um, in the surveys that we did, um, a random survey, most people believe local government rather than market forces should sh shape our cities. And as was mentioned um, initially um, by James Shaw, uh, in fact, um, I think one of the things that COVID has made clear that there are things that government can do, both central and local government, that just um, cannot be done or are, are, are not on the agenda of private companies. So this public housing and well-being, and if you want to have a look at more about it, that um, it's on our website. It's a five-year program, and we're focusing on the quality of public housing as a way of reducing inequalities. Um, I just um, was doing interviews at lunchtime. The new economic survey has come out, and yet again it shows that um, after paying housing costs, people on rental housing, um, more than twice the number of people up. 40%, uh, twice the number of people, over 35%, I think it is, um, pay more than 40% of their disposable income for housing, whereas people in the top income group um, uh, pay only, there's only 3% of them pay 40% of their income. So it's um, how to reduce inequality through housing and how to drive well-being and, we were, uh, and sustaining urban regeneration. So we're interested in that critical linkages between public housing, urban design, energy transport, impact on climate emissions, and all of these are levers, levers for change. Now, it wasn't just that I was a sort of um, supporter of Kainga Ora, I mean, on the board to be critical, and we decided that actually there are many ways in which public housing, which for those of you who haven't sort of quite noticed the change, when uh, the new the Labour Green government got in, it, would, it changed from social housing to public housing on the basis that um, people on the accommodation supplement under the previous government, were, it was said that they were in social housing because they had a subsidy. So to make the difference clearer, if your public housing now is that it's owned um, by the various organisations, and we're comparing six of them. Uh, we want to, to look at the comparative effectiveness and co-benefits of different housing models so that we can draw lessons. And we're looking at the quality and health and well-being of the tenants and communities and what they're managing to do about reductions of carbon emissions. So the context is um, buildings, transport infrastructure and other long-lived assets lock in carbon emissions. And you, if you remember, those of you who came when Diana Urgvortsat was here, um, one of the IPCC leaders from Hungary, um, where we had originally quoted each other's work over time. And this is the concept that she uses, I think, very effectively, that the embodied carbon in a building 
um, affects not just that um, the amount of carbon in the building, but how you operate the building. And so we have to look ahead one, two, three generations for lowering these. So we're one of the first governments in the world to adopt a well-being um, budget framework and combined with the 2019 Zero Carbon Act, where it provided system incentives to combine the pursuit of well-being and decarbonisation. And this aligns with work I and other people have done, obviously, with the co-benefit outcomes and also the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So there's the research team. Um, it's multidisciplinary, people in the social sciences, economics, epidemiology, engineering, Māori, Pacific, and multi-institutional. Uh, I thought this was rather appropriate, like a kind of networking thing behind it. <laughs> ping, 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 ping. Uh, Otago, Victoria, Massey, Waikato, um, Motu, Wanuia, Mata Marae Trust, and the public health housing providers. And these are the people that we're in partnership with. And um, Kaingora, Homes and Communities, although I, um, I'm speaking here not with my, as I said, the Kaingora hat, but with my um, um, University of Otago hat. Um, we're um, partnerships with Natitoa in East, Eastern Porirua and the Regeneration Project. Um, this Kaingora um, Homes and Communities, that represents that they're doing regeneration, and that's become critical as you will have noticed with all the sewage and the water and the gas pipe leaks, um, that there's an estimate of something close to 80 billion in deferred maintenance and civil engineering. And this is why when people say, oh, why doesn't Kayangora go faster or any of the other outfits? It's because it's, there, there's such a deficit in these things, you know, equivalent of 78 million um, litres of sewage, raw sewage going into Pororo Harbour because all the pipes are broken in East Pororo. And then the councils have not got the capacity or the not getting sufficient rents to do it. So we're looking at two regeneration projects, Tamaki Regeneration Program that we've worked with for about five years now. The Wainui and Mata Morai Trust, who are um, sisters, uh, are, are there. And that's the one where we're um, actually building Papakainga housing in partnership with Kainga Ora. Uh, around the outside of the Marae, and we're going to have one of these smart energy grids that um, Mark Appley, who's on the team, and also um, Ian talked about, uh, and Ray from his environmental economics is looking at. We're looking at the Otatahi Community Housing Trust, which is the, when Christchurch, which was the only other large um, local government provider, Wellington being the other one, um, Ponaki being the other one, decided that they weren't getting income-related rents. Ask me a question about that if you want, if you don't understand that later. They put all their housing there, um, 22,200 um, houses, uh, into a trust. And the other one is the Salvation Army. So we've got, we've got charitable foundations, uh, community housing trust, of which there's a number in New Zealand, Wellington City Council, which actually found it was so expensive to remediate their housing. They're now put, they're increasingly putting their housing on long-term lease to Kaying Order. The Marae Trust, which is independent on Māori reserve land, and the Tamaki and Eastern Potorua, both of which were set up basically by the previ previous governments as a way of um, trying another model other than them being ownership. Some two of the books that we published before. This is we hope those of you who've come along and enjoyed it will come to ones in future or suggest things. Pane Tupa Ora, which we did with John Gray, um, who's here I think now, isn't he somewhere? Yes, <laughs> um, which was looking at what indigenous knowledge and, and sustainable urban design, and that's been much used. And we've got a number of other books which are out there. Okay, so what research methods? How can we look at this big policy experiment? Um, experiment. So there's um, policy research of natural experiments. We're looking at a comparison of these current public housing providers. We use surveys, models, observation, and we use the integrated data infrastructure, infrastructure the administrative si um, system that links every time you have contact with the um, government, whether it's for prisons, um, health, uh, educational performance, employment, taxes, whatever, that's all there. And we, we have a data lab laboratory here. There's very, very strict ethics. And the data, after it's checked with Stats New Zealand, is an all anonymised. 
Uh, and so that enables us to make comparisons going back before people shifted into housing, uh, forwards and between the two places. And Neville Pierce, who's um, been here at times sitting there, is the, the master of that. And uh, uh, we, he's already we've done a big pro project on housing first. So we're looking at the governance structure. Um, I teach public policy here, and the, the steering function of um, boards, I think, is very important from the Crown Company of Kaingo Ora, which was set up, it's the only Crown Company that isn't, doesn't have to make a profit before it can do social responsibility. It was set up to work with Māori to increase quality. It's got very um, high order goals that it has to do, and making a profit isn't on there. Uh, and it, you've heard actually Patrick and other people has a number of strategies, customer strategies, sustaining tenancy, that ghastly thing with meths, um, being accused, people being accused of mess and all their possessions thrown into Birksburn. Um, after that, they've had this very strong process of supporting people to work out their problems when they have been these people on very low incomes. It's been very successful. Accessibility problems, 15% of the properties at the moment are um, um, uh, universal design and we're sort of hoping to actually move higher. Landscape design guide and... Um, then the, the, the board, of course, has to monitor what's going on in the implementation and reporting. And the website is worth having a look at. Um, they are also the first organisation in New Zealand to pick up these housing standards. Um, and this is my favourite cartoon, which it's um, because I chaired the WHO Housing and Health Guidelines. And this, this um, chap here, who really does exist, Mr Mike Butler, who um, did a... Did a a rant about how terrible it was that landlords should have to up their quality of their standards. And he says, who's done it? Who's responsible? And this is, and this little thing, carrot here says, this is who, actually meaning this is the WA Housing World Health Organization. And so this is the one that we, we do lots of systematic reviews, looks at standards. And International Committee took about eight years to get through, but it's the one that underlines our Healthy Homes Guarantee Act. Um, which means that you've got to have insulation of a certain standard, not that high, I have to say, um, but, but, but basically it's performance-based. You have to be able to heat your house to 18 degrees. Um, you've got to have lower risk of hazards of injuries, crowding, and it's about seven things there, and I, I recommend going in and having a look at them. And these are healthy home standards. We are um, uh, healthy housing standards that were adopted in New Zealand, really based on those. Um, although we're still um, being activists for injuries, although sometimes the WHO um, kind of order talks about safe, um, it's, though we know from Michael Keel's work that this is a big factor, it's not in it at the moment. So we look at the quality, the topology and the scale of houses. Uh, we look at the indoor environment, we measure temperature, relative humidity, mould, hazards for trips and falls. Location to amenities and public transport. Mark McGuinness was talking about he got an extra point because there was a bus stop outside. So our, one of our questions is always, how close is this to public transport when they're building apartments? Standalone houses, townhouses or apartments, sprawl or urban density, and where there's a big effort on having mixed, mixed tenure. Um, now, this matters, and this is a bit difficult for you to read, but this is about Wellington here, and it looks at the carbon emissions that done by Nadine Dodge and... Um, uh, who did her doctorate with Ray, um, looking at the distance that you are from the CBD, and it looks at, and it looks at, if you're in Tiara, which is near where we live, Wellington Central, um, you're likely to do very little non-computer driving, and the equivalent of um, 0 0.0.2 um, tons of um, carbon emissions each year. And if you come versus if you come up here, Granada North or um, Makara, or um, Churton Park, you're much likely to do um, commuter driving and um, lots, of commu lots of commuter driving from Kandala, even though, actually there's a train running through there, um, commuter bus, the orange is commuter train. So you can see where you live um, um, makes a big difference to how much carbon you use in the transport, which of course um, is the the biggest emitter of carbon outside agriculture. So we're looking at a number of... Uh, how much time have I got, by the way? Okay. Uh, a number of um, outcomes and co-benefits. 
We have, very, we have a very high level of residential mobility in New Zealand. People are constantly moving around, which is not very good for um, children going to school, neighbourhood cohesion. So we're trying to, uh, and of course this partly is um, driven by the very short tenancies that you can get in the private sector. So we're looking at the length and security of tenure, increase in residential stability, um, the pro, um, looking at progressive home ownership, and the effects on equity, the amount of urban green and public space nearby, how much cycling and walking people in those properties do, effect on health and well-being, and the, the, the jewels in the crown, reduced carbon emissions. And just some examples from um, London, this is actually the way you can repurpose, talking of Mark's ideas about repurposing old buildings, this is, own, own, this is an old priory um, gardens in London, and these are, are green walls in um, Paris, um, which people love to sit nearby and are really beautiful. You can see the apartments here with the little window here. <laughs> so, of course, as Rafe said, um, urban form design and travel are very important. It's not everything, um, but um, density is largely determined by that, and it helps with other factors like land use mixture. And all these influence housing choices, travel behaviour, and quality of life. Uh, and the, the concept that we're very keen on is co-benefits. So we don't think there are trade-offs between, oh, you live in the countryside or in the city. There are co-benefits for health, community quality of life, and climate change. And this is in Bern, um, and where we, when I was working for the WHO. And we really loved the way they shared the streets here with cyclists, this um, light rail, rings the bell when it goes past so everybody knows to get out of the way. Um, so the critical building challenges, and this takes us on to the, what the book is about, my friend and I spent our day <laughs> helping to edit that book. Uh, we need deep residential retrofits. So that question that, that, that um, Patrick offered, uh, answered, uh, or that we asked Bill Rond about, about why aren't retrofits part of the new policy is very important because of the lock-in effect. And our current best efforts are not good enough to achieve best possible reductions in energy use. There are state-of-the-art policies. I was really interested to hear about the, um, Patrick's latest thinking about cross-laminated timber. I'm delighted that the building code is actually going to be born because we need the best possible performance. And there's a, the, the the brand's build magazine pointed out comparisons with Ireland and to other countries. We have by far the lowest um, requirements for insulation, even though we're in a more temperate country. And then Mark McGuinness wrote that thing about, you know, or, or, or raised the question about how do we know um, that we're going to um, meet zero carbon? And it's really great to have people like him and Guy really thinking about how to lower carbon emissions. And this is. Okay, thank you. Yes, I have seen it. Okay, so this is the link to the Sustainable Development Goals, which very much talks about interactions, not trade-offs. You can have good health and well-being, affordable green energy, sustainable cities and communities, and climate action. How many people here have, thought, have heard of the Sustainable Development Goal? Oh, wonderful. Mostly people haven't even heard about them in New Zealand. This is my favourite. This I just went swimming last night to wake myself up. This is the old lime breweries. This is the transfer the, as, a, as used to get the heat for the Thorndon swimming pool used to come from lime breweries. And I think we could do much more of that kind of stuff of linking um, one place which has, has excess um, electricity using for heating stuff. And they're doing something like that at Christchurch, I think, heating the swimming pool. So um, this is an aside. The impact of um, COVID, basically I'm saying... Um, we have to be thinking, you know, given that we're going to have recurrent even efforts of this. Those who are living in their um, poor quality private rental housing um, where they spend, um, you know, a third of them spend more than 40% on their housing costs. We've got to, um, house, being sequestered in houses like that, quarantined in houses like that, is really problematic. So we have to make sure that Homes not only give us security and stability, but they're um, safe. And so in conclusion, um, we have a current housing shortage which concentrates our mind. Um, climate change and COVID all require innovative thinking and systemic responses. 
I think the, one of the messages I've heard coming consistently through the talks here is you can't just think about one thing in isolation. And as Guy and Rafe and I found out when we were looking at the people's preferences, people's preferences are changing. People quite like apartment buildings now as, le as long as there's balconies and as long as there's, they can easily get to space nearby. We need to think ahead to resilient future systems. Public housing research um, with serious government funding, and I think you know, we, the, the, the well-being bonds of which we, the government's enabled us to do eight billion in Kainga Ora. I'm going to stop saying we. Kainga Ora is enabled to put out well-being bonds, some of the first in the world, and they were snapped up like this because people, because when there's no interest, people are looking around for something that has a feel-good factor, and actually we have to, we have to report um, to these people um, as well as to the, you, the public. Uh, so serious government funding and given permission to raise money, which outside of um, the Crown accounts is very important. And there is huge potential. I feel very optimistic after today. It's made me feel even more cheerful. Huge potential for more sustainable living with coordinated policy changes to support compact urban form, more affordable housing and sustainable transport. And that's what we hope we're going to provide through our MB grant with solid evidence for it. My dream is that we can have a bipartisan view about um, public housing so that we don't do the stop starting. And we help to provide the evidence. Thank you.